Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. This video continues on from where my last one ended when I claimed it is highly likely that Pliny the Elder is correct in his assertion that the Great Sphinx was transformed into the tomb of King Amasis II in the 26th dynasty of Egyptian history. Of course I have to say that I don't think the original purpose of the Sphinx was to be a tomb, but that I merely think that part of the Phase 2 restoration work of the Sphinx in the 26th dynasty was to turn the Sphinx into a tomb for their greatest pharaoh, King Amasis II. And before anybody says that this is all mere speculation, there are several eyewitness accounts of both the vertical shaft that leads to the chamber, as well as the chamber itself. A number of people have entered it and wrote about it, and for many early chroniclers, it was the main focal point and feature in descriptions of the enigmatic structure. Yet in the modern era, this information has been buried, in more ways than one. Emil Barese is believed to have literally buried it in cement in the 1920s, and Egyptologists have buried the knowledge by leaving it alone inside dusty old books, and nobody has mentioned it in decades. This is a prime example of how real history can so quickly become myth and legend. But if we are ever to fully understand the Sphinx and the Giza Plateau, we need to ensure the important discoveries of the past are not forgotten and remain in the public eye. There is, without any doubt, a shaft that leads to a burial chamber underneath the Sphinx. And no, I'm not talking about this hole at the back of the monument, shown here in this famous picture with Zahi Hawass. This particular shaft is well documented, and diagrams and photographs are widely available. No, the shaft I'm talking about was located where the hips join to the body. It's in the centre of the huge fissure that cuts across the back of the Sphinx, which I've marked here on this diagram, and after trawling old historic books, and with help from Robert and Olivia Temple's amazing book, The Sphinx Mystery, it seems to be first mentioned by the German Johann Michael Vansleben back in 1679. In his book, which is available to read online, Vansleben says, In the hinder part is a cave underground, of a bigness answerable to that of the head, into which I have looked by an entrance that leads into it, so that it could serve to no other purpose but to keep a dead corpse. In a second account of the chamber, Vansleben says that the chamber is as tall as it is wide, being approximately 26 feet. Traveller Ellis Verriard went to the Sphinx 22 years later, and he too notes, and I quote, that we found a subterranean vault cut out in the firm rock, which in all likelihood was a tomb. Thomas Shaw then visited in 1721, and records his observations of the Sphinx in his 1738 travel book, stating, Sands were accumulating to that degree round about it, that we could but just discover the ridge of the spine, at the end of which, just over the rump, there was a square hole, about four foot long and two broad. He goes on to say that at this time, it had been filled up with sand, and therefore could not be entered. In the 1730s, Charles Thompson went to Egypt and published a book on his travels, and he too notes the hole in the back of the Sphinx, and that it was around 5 feet long, but sand had certainly accumulated inside, as it does not describe what lies within. Richard Pocock was next to mention the hole in the back of the Sphinx in his 1743 publication, A Description of the East and Some Other Countries, but being filled with sand, it also meant that he couldn't go inside. We wouldn't learn anything more about the shaft and chamber until Captain Giovanni Caviglia began his work clearing away the sand from around the Sphinx in the 19th century. And although many don't know, Caviglia did enter the shaft and the subterranean chamber, and by all accounts he even mapped the interior. Caviglia gave most of his papers to the British consul Henry Salt, some of which are kept in the British Library, but those concerning the shaft and the chamber ended up in Florence. August Mariette notes that in 1833, Egyptologist Charles Cottrell found Caviglia's papers in Florence and states that they included the plans of two Sphinx chambers, one of which contained hieroglyphic texts. The one without hieroglyphs must be the one at the rear because we know exactly how the interior looks. If Caviglia noted down these specific hieroglyphs, they could be translated and we could possibly know who exactly created the chamber inside the Sphinx, and possibly who was buried inside. But sadly, Caviglia's papers are now missing, and to this day, they remain unpublished. Caviglia's work is the key to solving this puzzle, but we do learn a little more from August Mariette in 1855. 
As it says in the book, excavations of Monsieur Mariette at the Great Sphinx, he found the vertical shaft identified by Van Slabben in 1679, and with all the sand removed thanks to the work of Captain Caviglia, he entered the shaft and recorded the following. This shaft, explored with care, presented at its bottom a roughly hewn chamber, which was, in reality, just a natural fissure enlarged by the hands of man. In this room lay some fragments of wood that gave off a strong smell of resin when burned, which led one to believe that the wood came from a sarcophagus. Ludwig Borchard then mentions it in 1897, and he states, and I quote, the occurrence of two vertical shafts on the back of the Sphinx, one of which ends in a burial chamber, in which coffin boards have been found. From this we can infer the earlier existence of a mastaba on the back of the Sphinx. But that is sadly the last we will ever hear about the Sphinx chamber unless Caviglia's missing papers from Florence turn up. Because in 1926, we are told that Emil Baresi poured cement into the huge fissure along the back of the Sphinx, including the vertical shaft into the chamber, all in the name of restoration. But from these historic accounts and diagrams, we do know a great deal. We know exactly where the shaft is as well as its size. We have an idea of the size of the chamber thanks to the historic writings, that it was likely a natural cavity at first but then worked by man, and that it included hieroglyphs as well as coffin boards. If small fragments of these boards still remain today, they could surely be carbon dated. And that's what we really need to do, reinvestigate this chamber. But as I said earlier in this video, and as other authors have reported, the shaft into the chamber is apparently closed up with cement. But is this really true? In the 2010 documentary on PBS called Riddles of the Sphinx, Zahi Hawass opens a shaft on the back of the Sphinx and a camera is pointed down. Here we see inside. At the top of the picture we see the Sphinx limestone bedrock, but on the right hand side we see a more modern brickwork construction. To me, it looks as though Emil Baresi wasn't quite as destructive as we think, because the shaft has clearly been lined with masonry and preserved. Looking on satellite photographs of the Sphinx, and we can see the exact position of this metal hatch, in the precise location of the shaft mentioned by the historic writers. Emil Baresi did preserve the lost burial chamber, yet this shaft was not mentioned in the 1950s by Sphinx researcher Selim Hassan, and the 2010 documentary says it leads nowhere, which simply cannot be true. Why is this a big secret? Later geophysical surveys have shown not one, but a number of possible chambers and tunnels inside and underneath the Sphinx, which are likely all connected, and yet there seems to be little interest in the authorities looking into this any further. Starting with Pliny and then every explorer mentioned in this video, they all talk of the Sphinx being the tomb of Amasis, who I identified in my last video as King Amasis II of the Sate period, because his son, the prince and army general, as well as his most beloved queen, are also buried very close by. I do believe that the shaft and burial chamber were not original Sphinx features, but later additions. And even though such a find isn't a lost hall of records, or anything relating to the origins of the Sphinx, it is a huge piece of history of this monument, and as we can see, the entrance shaft has been preserved. The 2010 documentary says that treasure seekers likely dug the shaft. So, if true, why did those that restored the Sphinx line this shaft with masonry and also cover it with a metal hatch? If it is a dead end, a mere crude shaft, why not just fill it in with cement to firm up the structure? Emil Baresi clearly left this shaft for a reason, and the only viable reason is because this shaft is the one that leads to the burial chamber. As this historic photograph shows of the back end of the Sphinx, from before Baresi began his restoration work, there is a huge crack through the rear of the structure. Baresi did fill it up, but he made sure that the entrance shaft, and hence the burial chamber, were saved. The metal hatch we see today is located on this crack, and exactly the location of the historic shaft to the burial chamber. We know precisely where it is, we know what is potentially inside, and going public with the information of a burial chamber accessed through the Sphinx would make headlines around the world, and all for the right reasons, and tourists would no doubt flock to the country to catch a glimpse. We know it's there, and it's about time it was written into the history books. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.